Maltese Voices Down Under was a two-disc CD produced by Barry York for the Europe Australia Institute at Victoria University of Technology in Melbourne in cooperation with Kevin Bradley of the National Library of Australia in 1998. CD 1, which we are about to hear, had the theme Memories of Malta and Gozo and it consists of excerpts from oral history interviews recorded for the National Library with Maltese migrants of the vintage from 1916 to 1958. The excerpts are interspersed with music performed by Maltese musicians who were recorded by the National Library in Sydney and in Melbourne. For full credits, please look at the list at the end of this CD for the musicians' names and other people without whom this project would not have been possible. on the 9th of September <laughs> 1912 I'm antique man. I'm antique mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm 81 I was 81 yesterday as a matter of fact yes as I said before happy birthday <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> and so you were from Nisi- Nisi- yes yes and uh, it, by the way at that time it was called Mesida now they've changed it, altered it, I should say, into MSIDA, M-S-E-D-A, M-S-I-D-A. Now, I introduced you as uh, Joseph Cooper. Yes. But I believe you're, you changed your name. I had my name changed when I was in England by Date Paul, of course, which is published in the uh, Government Gazette. And uh, so what were your parents' names? Uh, Calafato. It's an old Italian name. Nearly everybody's got a nickname. Uh, that's 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 a sort of a, a habit which we acquired from bloody Sicilians. Sicilians have nicknames too. I found out. I was reading some Sicilian story about Sicilians. And uh, but to the best of my knowledge, I uh, we don't had we never had a, a nickname. If anything, we had. And in the old house, they had a, a huge olive tree in the front garden, which was taller than the building, which is two stories. Mm-hmm. And uh, they used to call it uh, Julia Tazebuja, uh, Julia of the of the of the uh, of the olive tree. Mm-hmm. You see. Yeah. So that was after your mother, then, wasn't it? Yeah, more le- m- well, yeah, that the old Tazebuja. Well, those who live, those who live at the. Uh, where the big big olive tree stands, you see. That olive tree, you used to get about five and six buckets full of olives every year, every year. They had big uh, earthenware jars, and uh, I think they used to fill them with water and salt and then uh, and put the uh, the old olives in uh, in them, you see. <laughs> Dina's a very quiet place and very religious area full of Monsignors, retired priests and they become Monsignors and then they retired Monsignors so um, and uh, nobility they had big houses big palaces 
and very few people. We were only a few people. We were lucky if we were all together about 200 in all. We were all one, you know, the nobles and we in the middle class, call us that way if you want to, uh, or whether there were the poor people. We all mixed together. There was no difference. So we were brought there, born there, lived there and stayed there till we migrated to Australia. My mother is from Imdina. My father was from Rabat, which is uh, throwing a stone across the bridge anyway. From my father's side, there's not much we can say because his father died very young and left his wife as a widow. And my father was the oldest man of the family. So therefore he was the father for his brother and sister. Our nickname was Tapenza. The reason for that, I think, his mother was Sapienza, and they just called my father Tapenza, cut the Sapienza short and put it Penza. Ah, Sapienza. Sapienza, was a yes. And that was not her first name. Ah. His surname was Muscat, and that's how it came, Penza. Because names, everybody got to either Muscat, Muscat, or Borch, or Attard, or so on. But by that little phase you'll find out who is who mm -hmm. yes you finish up with a nickname I think you either carry on from your father or perhaps you've done something and it's stuck with you they'll give you a nickname and it's stuck with you but 99% your nickname carry on from your father's family I yeah um, mm. do women have nicknames as well as men no not as much no i think the women don't have nicknames it's mostly go through the father mm. yes sometimes there was uh talam or uh, or the dudu or um of course they say chance to laham so they call him Chen Sutalam to distinguish him from somebody else. Perhaps that's his name is Chen Su with the same surname. Yep. I remember one old man, his, his name was a Dudu. And I think it's the way he used to walk mainly was his nickname because he used to have very small legs and he used to walk very small step. Mm -hmm. And you know, a Dudu means a little creature, I'll say. And he used to walk just like that little creature. <laughs> say the best uh, uh, part of Malta because it was modern, uh, it had the seafront which was very beautiful and uh, uh, but that is uh, uh, I suppose anywhere you know I mean you see the riches of London and then you see the slums mm. in the East End mm. Mm. or uh, uh, you look at uh, Melbourne or Sydney with uh, uh, the big hotels and things like that, and yet there's still poverty. Do you think your parents, oh, given yes. that they were from Gozo, did they adapt to Slima? Or? Oh yes, they did. Oh yes, I think so. Because after all, you know, uh, my mother wasn't the type to uh, go out much, and yet I must say, on the carnival days, we had a carnival in Malta that goes for three days. And even at her age and with all us children, she still used to wear the fancy dress mm -hmm. and uh, go around, uh, go around the, uh, to Valletta and dance. They go from one theatre to another and performing their dances. And also they uh, dress uh, 
say one year I remember uh, one group they dressed as octopuses mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, another group uh, dressed like um, uh, Spanish uh, teodos like you know and uh, uh, all the group and they compete and they get good prizes mm -hmm. at the end and also we had a procession uh, similar to the Mumba here nice. and uh, that procession uh, especially before the war they used to make fun of Mussolini and Hitler they used to put uh, somebody dressed and somebody kicking him or something like that mm -hmm. and also uh, a critic of uh, the uh, government it doesn't matter which one is in also uh, some beautiful uh, uh, trucks full of pretty girls and uh, and also uh, advertising you mm -hmm. know but the main thing of the carnival was that everybody enjoy themselves and also the competition of the dancers mm -hmm. from each town awesome. and uh, I heard that as soon as the carnival is over they start preparing for the next year yes. <laughs> and uh, the final dances and the judging dances are part of going from one theater to another it used to be at uh, uh, the square in Valletta outside the governor house or palace and uh, I think they used to check him their judgment mm. then the prizes be presented mm. but it was a great event it goes for three days and it's been going on for hundreds of years mm. and uh, uh, I think everybody did enjoy themselves mm. you know because sometimes they even uh, when the uh, floats are moving they used to throw lollies, you know, and of course it was a big event for the kids to uh, uh, try and catch a lolly too, and I hope they carry on uh, the same thing uh, today. Did you ever participate in it in costume or...? Yes, oh yes. Uh, they uh, dressed me up as uh, Pierrot, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I did... Uh, enjoyed it and another time they dressed me up as a pirate mm -hmm. you know and uh, they uh, when I say they that means my mother and sisters but of course she participated too would you believe mm -hmm. my mother with all us seven bloody children and she's still uh, dressed up and went and dancing around mm -hmm. so uh, it's wonderful especially now that I'm old myself you know, I go think back and say well, how wonderful woman she was. But look, I want to return to the uh, family life at, at Iswad Street when the family was all together. Yes. And just ask another question about that. Yes. After dinner at night, I take it there would have been a couple of hours before you'd go, actually go to bed. Yes. What would you do in that time? Oh, as I said, we uh, go up on the roof, we sing, you know, we uh, talk, we laugh, we joke. And then, of course, we say uh, the rosary and other prayers. And by the time you've done that, it's time you went to bed. Did any of you play a musical instrument? No. Did everybody sing? Yes, yes, we all sang, uh, you know, the old Maltese song, you know, mm -hmm. like Oni lekta lipsa hamra, mil bachsip tek shikanal, manach nok shil jig jifogu washtipsa mil lisparal. You know, things like that. And they are very uh, Maltese folk songs, I mm -hmm. would say. And, uh, but uh, and also we used to sing songs that we uh, might have seen uh, uh, or heard in a tea shop or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, when the films start coming out in a talkie picture, naturally we 
were adopting and copying the uh, uh, the songs. You know, we try to remember them and sing them at home and so on. I suppose your parents sort of taught you some songs, would that be right? Yes, well, you could hear them uh, sing, especially my mother. She would sing. And then, of course, there was Jessie, you know, she used to sing too, all these songs. And uh, so, uh, and also uh, jokes, you know, like uh, uh, if you uh, see somebody with a must. Tash, you know, and uh, they uh, used to say, Kalizim el Mortinalu, Umustachir, Isom Tashkalu. I went, I mean, in English, when you translate it, it doesn't <laughs> sound right at all, but I went and done the horseshoe on a horse, you know, fixed him with mm. his horseshoe. And uh, and his moustache looks like a, a, what you call it, not a shrimp, the other one. Prawn. A prawn, you know, because the moustache. <laughs> yeah, right. That's if you see somebody with a moustache, you say that. <laughs> so, you know, there were so many silly things which they are amusing yeah. at the time, especially. <laughs> Calcara, and mother was born at Bormla, and I was born at Calcara too. Well, what was your mother's uh, maiden name? Uh, Bartlow, Bartlow, Nora Bartlow, and she was the eldest of twelve children. <laughs> For a well, that was quite common in common Malta in, in those in, days. I'll say at twelve, yes, yeah, she was the eldest. And then my father, he was. Um, as much as I know, but he was in the in the navy in the canteen business there. And uh, what was his name? Frank. Frank. Yeah, he was there. And then um, after that, he came to Australia and went to New Zealand for a while. Do, do you know much about their parents, like your grandparents grandma, on grandma, both sides? Grandma, Grandma Skimbury and Grandpa. Oh, yes, I know them very well. I used to go there a lot, you know, and they're very nice. And um, Grandpa, he was more like my father to look at, you know, like his double. And Grandma was a little white-haired old lady like me. <laughs> Poor Grandma. Yeah, they were very nice people. And he had another three brothers. And they're all in the Navy. My grandparents. Uh, on my father's side, it was Joseph and, and, and Conchetta, Constance, is it? Chettina. Nana Chettina, we used to call her. And my mother's... Uh, Parents was George and uh, Rachel. They were all from Barmla. My mother's parents. That's where we used to we used to live with them for about oh ten ten or ten years before we came here. We used to live with Grandma. Poor old Grandma used to say, "When are you going to Australia so I can have a little peace and quiet?" Really. <laughs> <laughs> and when and when we did come over, she didn't live very long after that. Poor old Grandma. It was lovely. Grandpa was always fishing. I never used to see him home. <laughs> he used to love that. Grandpa was a blacksmith. And I used to go and take his lunch there. And I used to say, why well, didn't they buy, uh, cut a sandwich or something instead of taking the dinner to the dockyard? You know, it was so, a bit dangerous there. But I don't think they used to think of danger over there. <laughs> Every dinner time I'd take his lunch. And the uncles who was working there and uh, wait for the place to bring him back home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I often, you know, used to say, why, why? Like I said, why didn't they cut a sandwich? Save me all the trouble yeah. <laughs> over there. Because I suppose that wasn't a the custom then, you see, you know. Poor old grandpa had to have a hot lunch. <laughs> and did, did you say that, that you lived with the grandparents? We lived with, because my father was here. And uh, then we went, we went to live with grandma and grandpa and, and her 12 children. So we had a house for <laughs> And then after the war, then we decided, you know, to uh, come here. And then he started a business, and uh, when the business progressed, you know, he more or less had the money to send for us, you know. We came on the 
or so over there. It was nice. Did he, he must have come uh, during or before the First World War then? He must have, yes. He, I think it was before or just at the beginning of the war or so at that time. Because I remember George, the one that, you know, he wasn't born then. He was born after he left, after, you know, he left there. So who was George? George is my brother. Oh, right. He comes in here for his tea every night. God help him. So, <laughs> so he was born in Australia? He, no, he was born in Malta. We were all born. There's, I was born there, my sister. She's died since. And, and George, they were born there. Three of us. And then when Mum came here, she had another three children. Oh, I see. Joe and uh, Rita and Frankie. She had another three. The Aussies. Yeah, well, we came here in January and on the following March I was 10. What memories do you have of Malta? Oh, lovely. Beautiful. <laughs> I always used to think I died when I was in Malta and I went to hell or something when I come here. <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell them that oh, I was beautiful. I think of all the... Uh, I used to be really free and happy and in the summer we used to go to Witterline, you know what that is? <laughs> Marsa Scala. We used to go there for three months, and of course, being a child, I suppose I wouldn't have any worries, would I? I wouldn't, you know, I, every day was good. I was beautiful. It was very hard on my grandmother because she more or less had to keep us. Oh, you know, because, I mean, he wasn't working and there was no money coming, but she used to, uh, it was me, and my grandmother used to bring us up and that, and, and the uncles. So I don't know what would happen if it wasn't for them, you know. Some people used to get it good because. A woman used to come there with her milk, you know, we used to buy the milk from the, at the door, and um, she'd say, oh, well, I'll have to knock off early now because I've got to go and get, go to the post office to get the money what my husband is sending me, you know. And I said, gee, that's funny, we never get any. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a kid, you know, I thought, oh, my mother never goes here. Probably he wasn't working, I suppose, you know. This peasant woman used to come there with the, selling the milk, you know. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You know, used to come to the door there with the goats. <laughs> <laughs> and what would they do? They just fill they'd up. Fill, the, up, they'd fill yeah. up the glass, and mm. yeah, just. And then my auntie Maria used to say, "Hey, not so much froth there, not so much froth." of June 1938. Dad was um, a, a telegraphist with the Marconi company in Alexandria um, and he remained as such until we left for Australia. Mum was a telephonist in her younger days until she married and then um, was a housewife until we left for Australia. My father was Joseph Spiro Gauci. My mother was Ines Cord Cordes Gauci. Um, they were both born in um, Egypt, but their, I am not too sure, their parents or grandparents were of uh, Maltese origin, born in Malta. My grandfather was Spiro Gauci and my grandmother was uh, Concetta. That's on my father's side. On my mother's side, I did not know my grandfather, George Cortes, and my grandmother was Maria um, Cortes, maiden name Fennec. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, Spiro, I think was associated with the um, British Army. He was a, um, a chef at the um, army bases in Alexandria. How actually that, how he came to settle, I don't know. Um, my grandfather George, as I say, I never got to know him. Um, both grandmothers were just 
once they married, they remained as housewives and carried on their lives until they too left um, Egypt, which would have been approximately about the time of the uh, Suez Canal crisis, I think 1956. So I went to a um, Saint, Vin Saint Vincent de Paul, Saint Vincent de Paul school, uh, the one and only school I attended in Alexandria until uh, my departure for Australia. My uh, elder brother, uh, I have two brothers and a sister. My elder brother Edward, um, by some queer arrangement, he attended a British boys' school in Alexandria, and that was his only school. And my younger brother Percy came to the same school as I did, St Vincent de Paul. My younger sister was hardly two years old when we left um, Egypt, and of course she was a baby. What languages did you speak at home? Whatever came first um, of the languages that we spoke, which included um, Maltese, Arabic, French, Italian, some Greek. Um, two, two main languages um, applied to me. Um, French, because that was my upbringing in a French school, and I spoke French with both mum and dad, um, but spoke quite a bit of Maltese with with Dad and um, some of the aunts and aunties. Arabic came in as a uh, language of the country, of course. You naturally spoke that if you went shopping or something, uh, anything to do with the general public, you had a choice of probably one of two languages, usually uh, Egyptian plus whatever other language you adopted, whether it, if you were a Maltese, you might speak Maltese, or if you were French, you'd speak French, Italian, Italians, etc., etc. From memory, I think mostly mum and dad would speak to each other in Maltese, um, but we, um, it was just as easy to speak, say, in French or Italian because they were as well known. We, we've always regarded ourselves as Maltese. We had, uh, you know, Maltese clubs, Maltese associations, um, Maltese functions, all of these things which we, um, um, you know, adhere to and love dearly. If I'm not mistaken, I think uh, we were all, myself and my brothers and sisters, I think we would have all been baptised at St Catherine's Church, which was a Maltese church in, uh, in Egypt. Um, I think I have cited copies of certificates and things like that, um, uh, written in Maltese or in Latin by uh, Maltese priests. Mm -hmm. I have never been to Malta. My father has, I think. My mother never did, no. When I was born in Hamroon, which is an outer suburb, I think it would be the third suburb from Valletta. The second, actually. There was uh, Floriana and then Hamrun. Uh, in those days, everybody was born at home. I mean, if there were no complications, only the midwife came when it was time, you know. And if there were complications, the doctor was called. Which was a, which was something that the midwife didn't like. She liked to do it on her own. Take all the credit, I suppose. <laughs> now it's a different story. Everybody go to hospital like here, which is fantastic now. Mm -hmm. But yes, the three of us, the, my two other sisters, were all born at home, which was the usual thing. Dad gave the impression that he was the head of the family, and he could sort of put me in my place with just one look. But Mum was always the one that was right behind him. Whether she suggested it or, or automatically, Mum always ended up having her way. But it always looked like it was dead who done it. Mm. So actually, that was a very easygoing person. He was very kind, he used to help a lot of poor people in our area. If anybody needed some help, he couldn't write or fill up the form. Dad always sort of helped everybody. And he used to be very insulted if somebody came with a gift. Those days they give you a chicken or a rabbit, you know. <laughs> very few people in middle class worked. It was not known. I mean, mum had a, a mate who used to come every day to do the cleaning. And once a week she used to get another woman to do the washing. There was no washing machines in those days. And she never let anybody touch the kids. She looked after us and did the cooking. 
and mum managed the money. Dad used to be paid every fortnight and he had a good job. He was a compositor and a printer in the government printing press. He used to print educational books and he was at one time with uh, Strickland, uh, the Times of Malta, mm -hmm. and uh, just before the war started at his own printing press, which was bombed out of existence at the beginning of the war in Valletta somewhere, and he had to give up his share because we had to go to Gozo then. And I remember mum even selling her wedding drink to make up. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we were never really poor, even during the war. I was brought up going to the opera. I wasn't even supposed to be there because I was underage. I think I was about three or four. Mm -hmm. And I stood a tiny little box so I can see over. We had our own <coughs> little box there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which opera it was, but he was going behind him with this dagger. Mm -hmm. And I yelled out, look out! <laughs> and then, of course, during the <laughs> interval, everybody looked, because that was a kid's voice. <laughs> Where was I born? Well, as far as I know, the place was Strada Vardia, Adam. And I was born on the 25th of September, 1898. My father, all I know is, in the first place, he was at sea, but during that period, they were building a breakwater in Malta, in Valletta, to make the the breakwater to make the port of Valletta, and the place where my father was working in Gozo. During the blasting, it was the quarry, and during the blasting, he was sitting down, eating his meal. One stone hit him, and he died suddenly. There was a relation, and she was a neighbor, next neighbor to us. She came to my mother, to advise her, to tell her that something happened to my father. Mm -hmm. And of course he was dead when he was taken to uh, Victoria, or rather Robert. All I remember of my father was when, uh, when he comes home from his job, he used to take me all the Maltese got that habit. They used to go to a shop, meet there, and have a yarn and so on, mm -hmm. and they have a glass of wine, <laughs> and uh, then they go back to bed. And they used to get up early in the morning, especially the fishermen, back two o'clock and three o'clock in the morning. My mother and her sister, they used to work Maltese lies, they're making Maltese lies. Mm -hmm. But we had a few patches of ground, small plate pieces. And when my father was gone, mother and even me, I, we used to do something in them. There was only, we had a few plums and grapes and so on. And there were, we didn't have much land. I had a brother and one sister. one sister. My brother was Lawrence, he died here, and uh, my sister was uh, Mary, Maria. My sister was the eldest one, and uh, I was the uh, second one. My brother, uh, Laurie, was the third one. Laurie would be just a few months uh, after my father, when my father dies, right. he was still 
on the mother breast. Well, I can't remember much of my father, but I know my mother. She was a very kind woman. She, uh, she worked very hard for us. We, we were poor, but uh, she always do for the best for us. But uh, we was going to go to America, but then my father, he, they came from America to here, and uh, we had to come to Australia and she make little operation, but she fight. Mm -hmm. So we all uh, disturbed, like, you know, where my sister and my younger brother, instead of we come here, we all uh, spread. My sister and my father, my sister and my brother, the youngest one, they went with my grandmother. And I, they took me to the convent, and the other two boys, they came, one after each other. Your father was uh, Carmelo, is that right? Carmelo. Ca Camilleri. Yeah, Camilleri. And what was your mother's name? Um, before she married? Yes. Grace Mifsud. Mifsud, ah. Mm. And was there a family nickname? Palalu. 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 <laughs> well, uh, my father, he had two brothers here, Jack and Joe. They brought him from America. And they, give it, they sell the farm to, to him, to his family, to you. So, uh, when did he go to America? My father? Yes. He's always traveling. Three, three years there, and well, I, that, that's all I can remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, he, he was sick and I said, no, I said, you come to America now, instead of I go backwards and forwards. So, uh, they, we, she decided to take all the family to America, but it's all. Did, did your father ever talk about what he did in America? Oh, well, I was a child, I was, uh, you know, he was working, I don't know. I wonder if he, was he on the ships at all? It was no, in... no, somewhere in the factory. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was before... And uh, it was very hard to find a job. Did he ever talk about which part of America he went to? I think Detroit. Mm. Because there was a big uh, Ford factory, I think, yeah. the car factory. Might be, yeah. Because when you're young, you don't, uh, you don't understand about this thing. And so his plan was to settle in America originally, was that? He was, but uh, there, there was a strike and no work, no money. So the, the two brothers here, they sent for him. And uh, he brought my father and my brother, and we was going to come from Morta to here. <laughs> As a boy, you know, I was a bit naughty. <laughs> yeah, I left, see, I left Goza when I was between five and six years old. Ah, yes, yes. And we went living in Slema, in a place called Fortina, near the church there, you know. And uh, that's all I, I remember. We came with a sailing boat. We were this Maltese, what they call Daisang. Ah, yes. You know, it's a sailing boat. Mm. It was with the fin, we get all the finish here, there, and you come alongside to the jetty there, and we unload all the finish here from there. Mm. I remember that very well. You were born in Gozo? Yes. You, in Ansilam? Ansilam, yes. Do you have any memories of Ansilam? I had a friend of mine, Paul Zerafa, who was to be a postman that time. And he was to live in, uh, in Anselm Square. I remember him. And uh, I never, since I was in the Navy, I never got in touch with him. Once I sent him a postcard, uh, 
I know he was a postman because a friend of mine tell me that Paul is a postman in uh, Salem. Did, did he have a nickname by any chance? Uh, yes. Yeah, I remember. What? They used to call him Tal Kirsch. Who knows? I yeah, might meet I remember. Some of his people here. I, I remember. Know, I know the Paul Talkirsch. Mm. Yeah, I just remember that. I, n <laughs> I never think about it before, you know. <laughs> do you remember anything about the family house in at Arnsealand? What What was it like? The, the house we had there, it was three rooms. I remember we had the uh, cupboard built on in the wall there, you know, where we used to put the breads there. We used to, mom used to bake bread for the whole week. And she's storage in that uh, cabinet, whatever you call it, it's a hole in the wall, you know, yes. it's very old fashioned that. And I remember we had a big lemon tree in front, it's a very big one. We had the well there, and uh, we had the, in front, we had the big garden, fruit garden, and, and with a nice passage there. And we had the roof, big roof up there. Was that a flat roof? Flat like roof, roof, yes. Oh, yes, it's flat roof. And, and on Salem, they all call Loreto and Loretta. Same as my mother. My mother, Loretta, your father is Loretto. Yes. Uh, my son, Eddie, is not Eddie his name, Loretto. Because they, they, they send Madonna to Loretto, they call it. Uh, that's all Loretto, Loretta. Yes. You know the, how they have the feast days, like the festa. Did yeah, they have, in Anselan they have... Anselan, Loreto, Loreto, Madonna to Loreto. Mm. They call it Madonna. Mm. Madonna to Loreto, they call it. Did you go when you were a little... Yeah, boy? oh yeah, yeah, I used to go for mm. city firework, I remember that. Mm. And beside that, we used to go there, we take some friend, mom used to take some friends with her, with us for the festa, for about a week there. Ah, okay. I remember that because we used to live in uh, in Santa Rita Street in Slima. Ah, yes. yes. We used to take friends with, with us. I remember that. And it happened that Paul Zeraf, I told you, his father used to get us milk and food, you know, when we go there. And he used to have the farm. And, uh, you know, you take the bucket full of uh, <laughs> cow <Right>. milk. <laughs> In those days, they used to bring the goat from door to door. Yeah, that, that's that right. right in no, and, and, and Gozo was different. Ah. And Gozo, everybody got his own goats, you know, and this and that. And, and Malta, yes, used to come with hundreds of goats along the street <laughs> and selling eight and uh, eight <laughs> anything, you know. <laughs> The actual birth took place in Sanglea, where my mother, my mother's parents lived. My father at that time was he was um, a radio officer on the merchant in the merchant navy, and at that time he was uh, on one of his trips between Malta and England. I think at that time it used to be, and so he was away. So my mother went down to her mother's place in Sanglea, waiting my the birth, and that's where I was born. And then, of course, after that, uh, she took me back home in Xira. That's where we were living, in Xira. Uh, how many were there in the family, apart from yourself? Nine children, uh, seven boys and two girls. My eldest sister and then myself, and then seven boys after me. When I was about five, I think, or six, perhaps, the war broke out, and uh, we went to live, uh, evacuated to Rabat in Malta. And we, we stayed there for... Um, to, for the duration of the war and for about a few years after. And then we moved back to Xira again. 
I worked for three years with the uh, British Gov uh, Admiralty at Lascaris, which was uh, situated in the Bastions overlooking the harbour, the Grand oh, yes. Harbour. Mm. Yes. And I, as I said, I was always a very avid reader of Maltese, these Maltese romances, novels. Mm. And I used to imagine when I used to go to work, going through tunnels in the Bastions, you know, all the uh, history that yeah. that went through uh, in those days uh, mm. during the um, Knights of Malta when they were building those bastions and I could see myself walking in there and working there, you know, and mm -hmm. I used to imagine all sorts of stories happening there. So I really enjoyed that part of the mm -hmm. of my life there. Was that your job up until your yes, marriage? Yes, yes, yes. That was the only job I had for three years and then we were married and came out here. I was 12 years old when the war broke and because as I said father was was in the Navy and he was always overseas he always used to talk about the civil war in Spain about the Spanish Franco civil war mm -hmm. and he always used to bring us a lot of religious objects darts mm -hmm. from Spain mm -hmm. but mainly he said oh, probably German bombers bombard such and such a place, they escaped the bombardment. But he used to say that we used to fly the English flag and no one touches us mm. in there for some reason or other. And uh, he, he either buys these, these object starts because of our Catholic upbringing in Malta and they were very fine artistic pieces, mm. you know. He had a crucifix which he picked it up from the rubble and it was always very close to his heart for some reason or another, maybe because he picked it from the rubble. So uh, he prepared us for the war, he prepared mom for the war. We've got a place in, in a country in, at Hazabuj in Malta. He says, if something happens, which we believe that it will happen, he said, you just grab everything, leave Cospicua and go on there. And that's exactly what happens. I remember in the first day, when well, first air raid, I was late because I was an altar boy at St. Teresa Church in Cospicua and I was supposed to help Mass, to help the priest in Mass at the 7 o'clock Mass when I could see the guns at the dockyard in there next to the dockyard clock firing, no one knows what, sirens going, no one knows what happens and the way I went straight into the church, there was a big chaos in there, there was no mass, no nothing, everybody was sent home quickly. And I went back home and I can remember mom, she, she said, well I've got everything ready, you're all in here, we're going. You know, this country house, Adzebuch, which I spent the best days of my life in there during the war. Mm -hmm. I call it the best days of my life. Mm -hmm because I was in, in my young teens, 12, 13, you know, in there. But while I was there, I used to go to school then, to De La Salle College every day, no buses, no transport, we have to walk all the way in there. Apart from school, I played soccer in there, we used to play soccer, and it was fun going to and from. In there, despite, uh, despite the air raids, I think as kids, we, we didn't really mind very much about it and uh, I spent you can say all the war going to school in there mm. I think I reached up to the seventh class in there and uh, by the end of the war why well, I should think I was about 17 17 and a half by the end of the war and uh, I was too old to uh, uh, be apprenticed so I had an uncle at the dockyard and he found me a job as a clerical with the manager engineering department. I was like a writer on duty in there. But once again, he interfered and he said, oh, I think you should learn a trade. During the war, at the brothers, here's something. Geography was always Australia. And at the brothers, the first thing in the morning, after the sign of the cross, you'll have to know your geography. Mm -hmm. By heart. In geography, we only studied Australia. Probably in those days, I knew about Australia 
more than I know now, or more than, than the average Australian in that time knew about his country. Yes. Because we were studying Australia, mm. for sure. started all schools were closed for a while and uh, then there was no other alternative except to uh, try to take a job and uh, I found a job with the Air Force as a waiter in the first place we uh, were at Nashar the, uh, the Air Force brought all the uh, married spouses and uh, they placed them at a real uh, big villa at Nashar. I think the name is Villa Paradiso. Right. Yeah. If you've been if you haven't been there uh, you couldn't miss it in, in Nashar. Yes and uh, I spent some time with them in there then I was posted in one of the most bombed airports in the world, Luca Airport. Oh, yes. Then from Luca Airport, they put me at the uh, fighter fighter uh, uh, airport. Mm -hmm. It was Takali. It was very close to Nashar. Yes, and uh, I spent about uh, a year and a half in there at uh, Takali, then back to Luka, back to uh, Kali again, and from there I was called up in the army. And I served in the army for about uh, three years with the uh, REME, Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I was stationed, uh, at first I did my, my uh, recruiting course at a place called Xira. Then from Xira I was po posted at St. Andrews. Yeah, and I spent the rest of the uh, war in there. Then uh, all of a sudden, although it, the war was still on, only with Italy, the last phases of the war, my father came to me one day and he said, uh, would you like to finish from the army? And I took it as a joke. Well, uh, to me it looked like uh, it was easier to uh, grow a pair of wings and fly than to get out of the army. Anyhow, I, uh, I said, yes, I said, I will. I would like to get out of the army. Though I was doing all right. I was doing real good in the army. I was very happy too. And uh, he... Uh, he got me out of the army because Malta was very short of short of tradesmen, uh -huh. and as you perhaps know, Malta was completely wrecked after the war, and uh, they needed all the tradesmen they could get, and he got me with this uh, carpenter, master carpenter, and we used to work in. Uh, we had a real big place to work in, in Valletta.
one can keep the dog cart uh, wasn't a very nice place to work in because whenever rail, rail comes, the dog cart was bombarded. Mm. Uh, as I uh, was still a, a boy of 15, 16 years old, working on ships, seeing bits of bodies here and there. That when the uh, ships comes in, they've been bombed, you know. The worst, the worst scene I seen was the Illustrious. When it came, we went working on it, and uh, one bomb exploded in the hangar, and there was a lot of pilots torn to pieces. Some of them, they were ready in the plane. They get in the plane to mm. put them up by the lift, and mm. and some of them, they were uh, waiting their turn. That's one of the worst things I ever seen. What would happen during an air raid while you were working at the dockyard? When we were attacked by the Italians, uh, we were, uh, that was an, in, in June, I think, uh, June 1940. We had shelters there in the dockyard. There was a big confusion. The sirens sounded in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. The, us, the workers are going in for work, because we used to start, start at seven. And uh, anyhow, everybody went running in the shelters. The shelter where I've been, there were small screens, lighted small screens to hide, it, you know, to camouflage the dockyard. And some people died with that small screen because uh, they, <laughs> they, they light some of them in the, in the tunnel. There were a lot of people that were there, and uh, a couple of people were suffocated with this mosque. And uh, they kept raiding, and a lot of uh, people died in, in Kospikwa that day, in the evening. But then, uh, after about three months, I think the Italians uh, released a bit, and anyhow, when they used to come, they used to stay in very high and uh, throw the bump wherever it comes, you know. We even uh, used to keep looking at them. There was no shelters for the civilian people. Those days, uh, all they told the civilian people to stay uh, either under the stairs or under the trees. <laughs> which was uh, when I went home and told my mother what a bomb can do, because some bombs were dropped that day on the dockyard. Anyhow, then they start digging shelters. But till the Germans came, which was in uh, January 1941, few shelters were dug out and uh, a lot of lives were saved like that because when the Germans came, they, they didn't play. They throw real bombs, big ones. Yeah, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be every day going to work what, at what was really a well, target. Well, uh, sometimes, a target. like uh, once I was coming from work, uh, the driver of the bus had the permit to either if he wants to stop or if he wants to, he keep going. And uh, I was in a bus and kept going. And the one behind us stopped. And an incendiary bomb came on, on it at uh, Pietà. Mm. And uh, 23 people were burned to death on that bus. That one, one of the things, yeah. and uh, 
when the Germans used to come, uh, sometimes they make air raids uh, every one hour a plane comes. Just uh, to reduce the morale of the people, you know. Uh, you cannot go to the shelter and you go to work in the morning because you cannot stay on your feet. So I used to, after a while, I used to stop home. Not, not the first time I listened to bombs coming over my head, whistling, and when I, you, you, you grow cold in bed, when you say, had the explosion, you, you have that little bit of a rest, <laughs> you know it's not on you. <laughs> my wife lost her father and brother. Yeah, my wife lost her father and brother. And, uh, she was only seven years old. And they were buried in the shelter. Was it came? That's where her her father and brother died near the shelter. And the the shelter was blocked. They stopped there two days, like buried for two days. That was at Slima. <laughs> childhood. Life was very, very slow in Malta and uh, people were very disciplined uh, as regards to respecting uh, people of older generation. And uh, I finished from school in 1931 and at that time uh, Maltese was not taught in the schools, only English and Italian and partly French. So the Maltese I know is all self-taught, and the, the years I have spent in Palestine and Syria and Upper Egypt, which is, uh, uh, languages are very close to Maltese, they help me understand the Maltese language. And then I'm actually, I'm self-taught, and uh, all the uh, bit of grammar I know is, is all from books I read and studied. I started uh, as a compositor, with the St. Paul's printing press, and the owner was uh, uh, Joseph Kumbo, who used to uh, write a lot of uh, novels and stories, and we used to print them. Then I went to work for the Lux or Lux press in Christopher St. Christopher Street in Valletta, and after that I worked for the Times of Malta under uh, Lord Gerald Strickland, who. Uh, who happened to have been a governor four times in Australia. I, I know Gerald Strickland very well, and I took part in his funeral. He, he died in 1945 uh, during the war. And uh, I remember him very well. As a matter of fact, uh, during his uh, latter years of his life, he was not seeing very well and we have to walk carefully when coming down the steps, otherwise we would hit him and he would fall mm -hmm. all over the place. But uh, he was a very shrewd person. He liked the Maltese people very well, and he was always in trouble even in Australia. I think Dr. Evert uh, referred to him in, with some, some remarks that uh, he was always involved in some, a lot of trouble here when he was governor. I was working in the times of Malta and its Maltese equivalent in Berra during uh, the 1942 when the, uh, when the Blitz was in its fullest uh, activities. And uh, I remember Miss Mabel Strickland uh, used to pay us uh, five shilling extras for every year uh, during the night that we kept on uh, 
printing the paper because it was a record uh, that the paper, Airways or No Airways, was always published. And uh, uh, as, as a matter of irony, uh, w one day she stopped paying us the five shillings per Airways and the Airways stopped. <laughs> I remember that very clearly. In when I was working in 1942 with the Times of Malta and the Berang, it was then that I joined the Royal Air Force. Uh, when I joined the Royal Air Force, I made a, a police course in criminal law and investigation under uh, the patronage of Scotland Yard, and I was posted with, directly with the uh, Provost Marshal Mediterranean Allied Air Forces, where I served in Palestine, in uh, Egypt, in Syria, in Italy, and uh, I was in Tobruk, a lot of them all around the Cyrenaica. And I finished from the Air Force in 1949, when I uh, left Malta in November 1949 and arrived in uh, Melbourne. I disembarked in Melbourne uh, on the 5th of December 1949. I came on the Asturias, a ship with, uh, which, during the war time, it was a troop ship. Australia was in the fore foreground of uh, a place uh, like a heaven sent, a heaven sent opportunity because uh, I left Malta as a torn, torn island with a lot of buildings and streets uh, demolished. I lost my house in Malta during the air raids five times. Each time we go to a house, it gets uh, bombed. And uh, I, I left Malta in a very terrible state.
The musical interludes were performed by the guitarists Fred Kakia, Gary Camilleri, Manuel Kasha, lead guitarist, Vince Pulo, lead guitarist, and Joe Sherry. Laurie Armato was the mandolin player. Kevin Bradley was the sound archivist, engineer, in the Sound Preservation and Technical Services Unit of the National Library of Australia in Canberra. With thanks also to Mark Caruana of Sydney and Joan Garvin of Canberra for their helpful comments along the way, and Mark Cranfield and Paul Hetherington of the National Library of Australia for their invaluable support. Of course, thanks go to the 14 interviewees. Sadly, nearly all are no longer with us. The cover photo of the CD was taken by Barry York in Gozo, Malta in November 1995. Artwork and cover design were by Melissa Brown of the National Library of Australia. The CD was produced by Barry York for the Europe Australia Institute, Victoria University of Technology in Melbourne.